When I was in my teens in the late 1960s and early 70s, John Charles McQuaid was the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Dublin. He held the position between December 1940 and, and January 1972, and is remembered now by most commentators for his undemocratic influence over successive Irish governments. McQuaid's insidious authority was evident in social policy and legislation, and while it might not have been the most significant of his achievements, I credit him with inspiring me to question the Catholicism which was a feature of my early years. Ultimately, this questioning helped me to understand that the only way to solve the many problems facing Ireland and the rest of the world would be to change the political system so that it benefited everyone, not just the ruling elites. In this short talk, I'm going to discuss some aspects of life in Dublin during the last years of McQuaid's reign, which coincided with a tumultuous period in my own life and the start of my lifelong belief in socialism. McQuaid was born to a middle class and fairly well-to-do family in Coot Hill, County Cavan, in 1895, and he was a student in the National School there until he went to St. Patrick's College in Cavan. From there, he moved to the fee-paying boarding school at Blackrock College, and later to Clongo's Wood College, also fee-paying and boarding. When he left secondary school, he joined the Holy Ghost Fathers, and also attended University College Dublin, where he gained a BA and MA and a higher diploma in education. He was ordained a priest in June 1924 and immediately went to the Gregorian University in Rome where he was awarded a doctorate in divinity in 1925. In November of that year he was appointed to the staff of Blackrock College in Dublin and was the president of the college from 1931 until 1939. During his years in Blackrock he became well known in European education bodies especially through his role as chairman of the Catholic Headmasters Association. He was widely praised for his administrative and organisational skills, which were considered to have been particularly evident during the 31st International Eucharistic Congress, which was held in Dublin in June 1932. McQuaid was appointed Archbishop of Dublin in 1940, apparently after some lobbying from Eamon de Valera, uh, who had urged the Vatican to appoint his friend. During the years that McQuaid was president of Blackrock College, he became a family friend of the de Valeras, uh, who was Eamon de Valera, of course, being a former Blackrock College teacher himself. The relationship might not have been quite as clear-cut as McQuaid would have wanted. He would certainly not have been averse to biographer John Cooney's description of him as the co-author of Bunroth and Hare and the Irish Constitution. That portrayal exaggerated the role he played, although Article 44.1.2 acknowledged the special place of the Catholic Church, but it stopped far short of making Catholicism the state religion. Nevertheless, after 1937, de Valera frequently acknowledged McQuaid's influence on many of the articles in the Constitution, not least those relating to the position of women. When I was younger, I was fortunate to have a close relationship with my father, and he persuaded my devoutly Catholic mother to let me go to the secular coeducational secondary school to which I'd won a scholarship, instead of the girls' convent school, which would have been her preference. Dad and I used to walk up to Clontarf Rugby Club to watch weekend matches, and along the way we had many discussions about politics, religion and the state of the world. I remember several arguments about John Charles McQuaid and whether his apparent concern for social reform was genuine. As a faithful Catholic, Dad accepted the Archbishop's insistence that any measures to help the poor must be in the context of the true faith. And I quote, while I argued that if that was the case, McQuaid would surely dispose of the considerable wealth of the Dublin Diocese and solve most of the city's inequality and poverty overnight. Having a better understanding of class relations and political economy 50 years later, this is not a solution I would argue for now, 
But at that time, I'd become convinced that sufficient bread in this life of considerably greater benefit than cake in the next one. I would not have known it when I was younger, but during his presidency of Blackrock College, McQuaid was involved in setting up two societies which were supposedly intended to create ecumenical dialogue. The Mercier Society had a distinguished membership of Protestants and Catholics, but McQuaid used volunteers, really known aka as spies, to report to him on the discussions in the society, especially after the Vatican ruled that Protestants should not be allowed to defend their positions. After two years, the Mercier Society was suppressed. A similar fate met the Pillar of Fire Society, which was set up to foster relations with the Jewish community in Ireland. The entire membership of the Jewish Representative Council joined the society and did their best to publicise the Holocaust, which was already raging in Europe. McQuaid shut it down. Knowing this when I was in my teens would certainly have added to my intense dislike of Catholic supremacy as personified by this arrogant man. The mid to late 1960s in Dublin witnessed major stirrings of resistance to what the writer John Banville described as the demilitarised totalitarian state that Ireland was at that time. The city was experiencing a housing crisis, does nothing ever change, and there were high levels of poverty despite the increasing prosperity of the country as a whole. The industrial programmes of the Lamas government were praised but did little to narrow the gap between rich and poor. As a secondary school student, I was travelling across the city every day by bus from Clontarf to school at Sandymount and used to stop at the newsstand on the corner of O'Connell Street and Abbey Street where various left groups left their papers for sale to passers-by. I have to say they made a very valuable contribution to my education. The introduction of free education of or free secondary school places in 1967 threatened the power of the Catholic Church in education and was eventually to make a huge difference to children who might previously have had no opportunity to be taught past primary level. I remember in 1969 secondary teachers went on strike for decent paying conditions and many school students, including myself, took to the streets in support of them. McQuaid made his displeasure clear, but this had no impact on the strike, which was resolved after three weeks of negotiation between the teachers' unions and the state, rather than the church, which might previously have been the case. Now, while McQuaid, McQuaid was complaining about the secularisation of Irish society, there was plenty of evidence that the iron hand of clerical control was slowly being shifted. Bishop and the Nightdress incident on the Late Late Show in February 1966 indicated that younger Irish people were slowly developing a healthier attitude to sex and marriage than the repression that had been fostered by McQuaid and his colleagues. While McQuaid, McQuaid was not the bishop referred to, who had complained about the, quote, certain morally, or rather immorally, suggestive parts of the show, which were completely unworthy of Irish television, unquote, he had added his own condemnation, saying the piece was, quote, vulgar, coarse, even suggestive, and really unworthy, unquote. The woman at the centre of the furore, Eileen Fox, who sadly died a few months ago, dismissed it all as too ridiculous for words. And she was so right. For those of you too young to remember, her great offence at the time was to say she had not worn a nightdress on her wedding night. Mary Robinson's election to the Shannon in 1969 on the platform of feminist concerns, including the right to legal contraception, was enormously encouraging for a young woman who were facing the many legal restric restrictions imposed by legislation, which in turn was underpinned by some of the provisions of Article 44 of the Mayor. In 1968, the papal encyclical Humanae Vitae had been widely publicised from pulpits throughout Ireland, with particular endorsement from John Charles McQuaid, 
who had been singularly unenthusiastic about the church reforms proposed by the, Vatican, the Second Vatican Council. The encyclical made it clear that the all-male hierarchy of the Catholic Church was absolutely forbidding the use of artificial contraception. Thankfully, they did not reckon with the millions of women around the world who decided to ignore the prohibition and did so with the assistance of sympathetic medics, even in Ireland. On the international stage, the Vietnam War was the subject of global protests, including in Dublin, and I took part in some of the anti-war marches in the late 1960s. How many times over the years have I stood outside the US Embassy as the so-called defenders of the free world use their wealth and military might to uphold corrupt regimes? I was also influenced by the Irish anti-apartheid movement, which had been founded in 1964 while I was still in primary school. However, by 1970, when the All White Springboks team was touring Ireland, I was one of the many thousands who marched to demonstrate against South African racism and the Irish Rugby Football Union's craven support for the regime. In 1970, my mother discovered that I had been sexually active and rather illogically blamed my co-educational school for my behaviour. She arranged for me to get a place in the local convent school where I could do my leaving certificate, and she also sent me to see Michael Cleary, who was supposed to counsel me, I think. Cleary was supposedly the cool youth priest, probably because of his radio show and his appearances on stage. When I was sent to him, as soon as he started questioning me, I realised he had a rather perverse interest in the details of the sexual behaviour of a 16-year-old girl and got out there as quickly as I could. It was years later that the extent of his hypocrisy became known. While I didn't connect McQuaid and Cleary at the time, it is evident from research in recent years that at the very least, uh, McQuaid shared the approach of other bishops to abusive priests and placed the Catholic Church's interests ahead of the people he should have been protecting. Here is Cleary with another of his Episcopal pals, the equally hypocritical Eamon Casey. In 1971, my final year in secondary school and the last year of McQuaid's reign as Archbishop of Dublin, my life was directly impacted by the undue influence of Catholic social teaching on Irish legislation because I couldn't get access to contraception and in the spring of that year I discovered I was pregnant. As I was still under 18, rather than risk being sent to a mother and baby home, which had happened to other young women I knew, the baby's father and I left for London. Looking back, I don't really think my father would have allowed me to be forced into giving up my son. But the atmosphere in Ireland was still such as to make me unwilling to risk staying here. By the time I came back to Dublin several years later, the special place of the Catholic Church in the Irish Constitution had been removed by the referendum of December 1972, and John Charles McQuaid had died in April 1973. Although I continued to have an interest in politics and what was going on in Ireland and around the world, I did not become active again myself until 1983, when I took my young daughter out in a buggy to deliver leaflets, urging people to vote against the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution. Of course, John Charles McQuaid was not solely responsible for the failure of the Irish Republic to live up to its promise. But he's always symbolised for me the insidious influence of class and religion on how this country has been governed since independence. In the late 1960s, when I was starting to find out that there were alternatives to capitalism that might deliver equality and justice, I knew nothing about him other than the pastoral letters that were read from the pulpit of the local church that I did not manage to escape attending until I was in my early teens. His apologists argued that he had many excellent qualities, including his concern for the poor. But as far as I am concerned, he and his Episcopal colleagues caused so much misery that can never be forgiven, that whatever good they might have done is far outweighed by the bad.